Southampton, 1938. Rendezvous of ocean liners. Britain's premier passenger port. Gateway to the world. A haven of tranquil efficiency with an infinite capacity for taking the strains imposed on her by visitors flooding in from both hemispheres. But when in 1939 the blast of war blew in her ears, Southampton, with a nascent energy, collected within her ocean gates a mighty stream of war material to aid the champions of democracy in their bitter fight against the monster of Nazism, let loose on a Europe trembling and unprepared. Southampton was at once a frontline port, a role not new to her, she'd played it so well in the last war. Since then, huge land reclamations and extensive additions to her docks had fitted her for the gigantic task on which she was now about to embark. The needs of the BEF had to be met, and their supplies, countless objects in enormous quantities, had to be shipped. The ships and the docks to accommodate them were there, at Southampton. Though the tempo had quickened, the proverbial docks efficiency remained unimpaired. The slogan, Southern for service, yet obtained. With the supplies came the men, the advance guard of that heroic company which was to fight and lose in that first tragic episode on the fair fields of France. The boys of the BEF, with spirits high and yet untrammeled by apprehension, faced their immediate future with a firm conviction that the right would triumph in the end and that their cause was right, though the end did not come for many a long day. These were days of intensive activity and excitement at Southampton docks. Men, supplies, in fact the whole panoply of war, passed continuously through the sheds and over the quays. The Southern Railway personnel worked ceaselessly in cooperation with the military. On a flood tide of high adventure, the BEF embarked for destinations somewhere in France. As a prelude to future operations, liners, famous in their peacetime roles, took over their job of war work and steamed away to act as transports for Dominion troops. Many southern ships, which heretofore had played big parts in Britain's business and pleasure trips, went to war with the best of them. Among them was the little Sandown which for years had paddled her docile way between Portsmouth and Ryde. Here she is, equipped to sweep enemy mines from our shores and from the paths of our vessels. But in spite of ceaseless vigilance by the minesweepers, Southampton reaped a bitter harvest of damaged ships. Up to D-Day, over 800 of them were reconditioned in the dockyard shops. The disastrous fall of France brought its inevitable complications. To rescue the hordes of troops and civilians escaping from the continental beaches, a whole navy of little ships cooperated in a superhuman task. Southampton, with other British ports, received a motley throng of ships of all types and sizes and berthed them at her hospitable quay, a temporary refuge from the rapacious maw of total war. And so the vagabond army came and went, ceaselessly, for two weeks or more. Men humiliated and bewildered, in dire need of creature comforts and sympathy. In spite of their tribulations, defeat was not written on their faces. In the wake of the fallen BEF came a small, pathetic body of refugees from the Channel Islands. Their seagirt homes had become the early prey of the Nazi horde. The welfare services of Southampton operated splendidly. There was a warm welcome for these unhappy people whose immediate needs were speedily catered for. Even in war, Southern for service still meant something. And with a word of good cheer, they were dispatched. Now the beast of war had given his command and the skies over England rang to the echo with the thundering hoofbeats of the apocalyptic horsemen. With unparalleled fury, 
The Luftwaffe attacked. Death and devastation were everywhere. At Southampton, the dock employees worked with a frenzied energy to avert total disaster threatened by the destruction of their ARP control. Direct hits on a flour mill and a cold storage depot proved catastrophic. The ensuing fire burned for weeks, consuming a month's rations of meat and fats for the whole of southern England. The farmers' vain attempts to save them were seriously hampered by a sea of molten butter, which spread ankle deep all over the dock area, rendering the drains useless. The heat of the fires raging was so great that much of the water from the hoses turned to steam before it reached the actual fires. When at last they did subside, the ruined shells of warehouses, offices and rolling stock remained everywhere. Yet another victim of Nazi villainy had been sacrificed. But the docks could take it, like the rest of the blitz towns of Britain, and so Southampton smouldered on. Meanwhile, the dock workers remain still very much alive. Colonel Moore Brabazon, then Minister of Transport, came to Southampton to congratulate the Southern's ARP squads on their laudable efforts and efficiency. In this dark hour of Britain's need, a strong and friendly hand helped her to regain a vantage point from which the future could be regarded with a greater degree of confidence. America began to send over quantities of commodities necessary for the well-being of our peoples and for the effective maintenance of our war effort. The dock's nerve centers twanged with a transatlantic hum, its pulses quickened, and in a short time, Leafland was in full flood. The United States undoubtedly meant business. The dark, swinging silhouettes of Southampton's cranes wove a crazy rhythmic pattern in the sky as they delved into countless holds, bit hungrily into the teeming supplies, and reared again with the life-giving fruits of Anglo-American cooperation hanging pendant in their steely jaws. It was an inspiring sight. For two years, Southampton dealt with this huge traffic, both at the quaysides and on the rails as well. In time, the nature of the American shipments changed to something clearly indicative of preparation. Preparation for D-Day. England was now well populated with hordes of husky young Yanks. With them came their engines of war in staggering quantities. Southampton's quays and sheds were crammed with discharged cargoes, and all lines were cared for this vast priority traffic. Other traffic, coal and such like, which had been growing in volume since the fall of France, was sent in coasters to other British ports. Vital supplies for the much-discussed Second Front continued to pour in from the other side of the Atlantic. To a Britain grim and sorely smarting with a sense of rebellion against the Nazi warlords, the apparently inexhaustible supply of American war power acted on the general morale with tonic effect. No longer was vague hope alone the booster of Britain's spirits. She had regained confidence, the confidence that one day democracy would triumph. At our side stood the United States, strong and equally confident. Together we were going to win. To clinch matters at Southampton, the American staff organized for themselves a major port headquarters to deal with all matters of a transatlantic interest. Armed American military police in their famous white helmets worked with our own to ensure that the vital secrets brewing within the dock gates should not be probed by any unauthorized person. To replace the former ruined ARP control center, a new docks control was built with walls of steel and concrete 14 feet thick. Never again would this important nerve center become the helpless target for German bombs. With invasion as their watchword, the Southern's workshops set to with an astonishing versatility to construct some of the odd and unfamiliar craft required for a continental landing. 
Much of the work involved in this man-sized job was done by the skillful fingers of women who worked with exemplary application in a joint effort to speed our forces across the channel, this time to victory. During 1943 and 44, hundreds of workmen arrived unheralded at Southampton docks. They were the scene shifters recruited to prepare Southampton stage for a spectacle of unprecedented magnitude. Mulberry Port was being produced. The general idea of the Mulberry Port scheme was to prefabricate a harbour. Vast pier heads, pierced by mooring columns, were to be linked to the land by floating moles, and protected from the possibility of heavy seas by concrete breakwaters sunk at the required spot. By means of this artificial harbour, the indispensable doorway to Hitler's Europe was prepared for the passage of the invasion troops. These Cleopatra's needles, on which the pier heads rode up and down on the water surface, moored them to the seabed. And here is one of the floating moles for landing invasion troops and their supplies. And this, a finished pontoon, ready for action. As during the actual invasion, the weather was unusually stormy, the importance of the breakwaters mentioned before cannot be overemphasized. The sections were constructed at various places as well as Southampton, assembled at the docks, and towed across the channel with the rest of the Mulberry Port components. These views of the breakwater caissons during construction give some idea of the size of the job in hand. Southampton was undoubtedly the choice of location for the work. Two of her dry docks, one of them the famous King George V graving dock, the largest in the world, became miniature shipyards on their own account, with all hands contributing to the forging of this veritable key to the continent. As zero hour approached, so was the construction work intensified. Men were engaged night and day on this all-important task with surprisingly little interruption from enemy planes. In the dry docks, as soon as work on the caissons had progressed sufficiently, they were floated out and completed in wet berths nearby, while activity recommenced in the dry docks at once. Southampton, with her double tides and her seven miles of deep water keys, played a unique part in the Mulberry Port scheme, which resulted directly in the downfall of Germany and the bringing of peace to Europe. The Invicta, a super ship completed after the outbreak of war, had never fulfilled her intended peacetime purpose. Here she is being overhauled and preparing for her D-Day task of transporting troops and their landing barges to the French coast. The Invicta carried six of these landing craft slung alongside on davits of special construction designed to avoid damage during their launching in possible rough weather. The noble work of the Red Cross was greatly aided by two more southern ships, the Isle of Jersey and the Dinar. Many an unfortunate casualty at this time can testify with gratitude to the smooth passage he received in these vessels while on their errands of mercy. A whole sisterhood of other ships, wistfully remembered in connection with so many pleasant continental trips in former years, had rendered yeoman service since the day they donned battle dress. The Isle of Guernsey, the Aritz, the Maid of Orleans, and the Canterbury are shown here waiting in the wings for their invasion queue. All of these ships, with the exceptions of the Dina and the Maid of Orleans, survived their subsequent D-Day adventure without serious harm. A sidelight on dockside activities during the immediate pre-D-Day period is provided by the Providor Department, which undertook the revittling of vessels with food and necessaries direct from the Providor boat. With such a host of craft standing by waiting for orders, the Providor became one of the busiest and most popular departments working right through the invasion period. It
It's natural that the growing momentum of public opinion regarding the actual time of the expected invasion of Europe should have had its repercussions. At Southampton, everything was now prepared and ready for the fray. The air of suspense grew quite unbearable, and still the order didn't come. Everywhere lay the enormous sea of supplies, the countless craft of incredible variety, waiting and waiting. And all unexpectedly it happened. Instead of a routine combined operations exercise, the invasion was on. Democracy was to cross swords with the Nazi for the last time. D-Day had come and gone. The supreme importance of the task confronting the Allied forces demanded that this time there should be no failure in the supply lines. Southampton's dock roads were crammed with vehicles impatiently waiting for a cross-channel passage. During 1944, with the gross tonnage of Southampton shipping totaled 23 million tons, excluding the small craft. Two million tons were dealt with over the quays. The men over there were undoubtedly getting full support from the war factories of Britain and America too. Largely due to the unexpectedly heavy weather during the actual invasion, things had not gone entirely smoothly. There came constant and urgent demands for further supplies and reinforcements, and, as always, Southampton somehow coped with a large share of this tremendous traffic. It should be remembered that throughout the war, the docks were still operated and managed by the Southern Railway. To get all the supplies over the channel, a smooth working cooperation between the railway and the military personnel was absolutely necessary. Coloured American troops performed a particularly fine job in the rapid loading and dispatch of innumerable cargoes. More and more men came with the stores. Through Southampton's dock gate, indeed a gateway to victory, they poured in with one idea to carry right on to the heart of Nazi Germany till it was all over over there. And the sooner, the better. Eighteen Southern Railway ships had taken part in the invasion, which had brought with it the inevitable casualties. Once again, Southampton's dry docks became hospitals for those vessels which had received their wounds in the new front line. A major casualty was the hospital ship Dina, unhappy enough to strike a mine. It was thought she was lost, but skillful navigation brought her limping to Southampton for treatment. Only by continual pumping was the Dina kept afloat. Exactly how she managed to get back across the channel is still an unexplained miracle. On examination, parts of her seemed at least half full of water. As soon as possible, she was dry docked, and her wounds were revealed as the water receded foot by foot. These pictures show the extensive damage to her hull. The mine had done its work very thoroughly. The dinar was due for a long enforced rest, but she had won her laurels. Meanwhile, the dinar's traditions were being carried on by other hospital ships which were kept fully occupied. Arrangements for the reception of the wounded at this time were of the most comprehensive kind. Southampton Quayside swarmed with ambulances into which the stretcher cases were loaded direct from the ship's gangways. The cat-like tread of the coloured American orderlies saved the patients many an unwelcome jolt. The more serious casualties were slung in their stretchers from the ships onto the trolleys gathered to receive them, and then wheeled into the dock sheds where the special trains were waiting, ready to transport them to more peaceful havens of rest and recuperation. Preparation had also been made to receive less welcome guests, German prisoners of war. A measure of them arrived tired and dispirited. For them, the war was over. There was little doubt now as to the ultimate end of the business 
on which they had embarked with such confidence some five years previously. The success of the United Nations on the other side of the channel meant that the supplies necessary to maintain them must follow them deeper and deeper into Hitler's Europe. The French railways had been robbed of most of their rolling stock by the Germans during the occupation, and so replacements from Britain and the United States were sent over both as cargo and on ferry boats equipped with a special superstructure to take them. Loading gear designed expressly for the purpose was employed to lift heavy locomotives bodily from the quayside. Once aboard, they were run smoothly into position on the ferry boat's own rails. One most important feature of the shipping of this traffic was the special link span, which worked something in the nature of a drawbridge between ship and shore. By its use, whole trains of goods wagons, Red Cross coaches, and other rolling stock were enabled to run straight from the dock rails onto the ferry boats without the use of any lifting gear. The principle of the peacetime Dover to Dunkirk train ferry had been very successfully adapted to Southampton's wartime needs. Thus were the railroads of France replenished with the rolling stock necessary to carry our armies further along their triumphant road to final victory. And to mark that victory, a plaque was unveiled at the dock gates. 1939 to 1945. This tablet was presented to the Southern Railway by the 14th Major Port United States Army in proud and glorious memory of the men and women of the forces of the United Nations who sailed from this port during the war against aggression to secure the freedom of mankind. Now Southampton is returning to normal activity. She might take a well-earned rest, but that would not be in the docks tradition. Ships, once familiar at her keys, are now carrying passengers and merchandise again. Southampton is still Britain's premier passenger port, prepared to receive any ship and every ship. This is the wartime saga of Southampton Docks, gateway to victory, owned and managed by the Southern Railway. Mm -hmm.